News Sydney. 7 News with Ann Sanders. Good afternoon. In breaking news, Australia's energy market operator has taken direct control of the electricity market, suspending the spot market in New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, South Australia and Tasmania. The market operator made the call this afternoon, essentially giving them control of directing energy supplies to power grids across the country. It's the first time such a declaration has been made in more than two decades. New South Wales Energy Minister Matt Keane has welcomed the move, saying it will help prevent energy companies unnecessarily withdrawing supply. We'll hear from the market operator's CEO coming up in the bulletin. Millions of Australians will be getting a pay rise of $40 a week after the Fair Work Commission agreed to lift the minimum wage. The decision was made to ensure Australians on the lowest incomes can keep up with the rising cost of living. Straight to political reporter Jennifer Beshwadi in Canberra. Jen, good afternoon. Take us through the numbers. Well, good afternoon, and As you just mentioned, the minimum wage will increase by $40 a week or just over $1 an hour. This takes the national minimum wage to $21.38 per hour or $812.60 per week. It's an increase of 5.2%, which is above headline inflation and is the highest increase in 16 years. So about uh, 180,000 workers on the minimum wage will get that full increase. A further 2.5 million workers on award wages uh, will also get a pay rise. Many of those coming into effect from July 1, uh, but for people in hospitality, tourism and aviation, it won't actually start until October. Now, the the unions are pleased with this decision. They had asked for 5.5 per cent, but say that it's fair and reasonable and will help struggling individuals keep up with the rising cost of living. But business groups, they disagree. They believe that uh, the increase is too high and many business owners won't be able to pay their staff. Extra $40 a week is going to make um, a significant uh, difference. Uh, especially if you consider the basics, because if you're on the absolute minimum, all of your wage is spent on the basics, going to mean that people will actually be able to buy the food they need for their families. That cost will be an extra $7.9 billion uh, hitting the bottom line uh, of affected businesses as a result of this decision. That will add to inflationary pressures. Are they are going to have to look at passing on those costs uh, to consumers. Now, this was the bedrock of the Labor election campaign. They argued that wages should not go backwards, that they uh, keep up with inflation. Uh, in fact, one of the government's first acts uh, since coming to power was to write to the Fair Work Commission to increase wages. Uh, speaking in Gladstone in Queensland today after a Cabinet meeting, the Prime Minister welcomed the decision, saying hard-working, low-income earners will now have some extra cash in their pockets. It makes a difference to people who are struggling with the cost of living. The truth is that many of those people who are on the minimum wage are the heroes who saw us through the pandemic. These workers deserve more than our thanks. They deserve a pay rise and today they've got it. People will be seeing in their bank accounts what the change of government means. People will be seeing in their bank accounts a wage increase that never would have happened back when we had a government committed and determined to keep wages deliberately low. Uh, politically, this is a big win for Anthony Albanese, who can now say that he's delivered on his election promise. And Jennifer Beshwati, live in Canberra. Thank you, Jen. Well, despite today's minimum wage boost, there could still be tough times ahead. With the country's top banker warning, we need to be prepared for higher interest rates and skyrocketing inflation. Chris Reason is following developments. Chris, the Reserve Bank governor predicts inflation could soar to levels not seen in 32 years. Good afternoon, that's right. It's rare that we see the Reserve Bank Governor make any public statements at all unless there is extreme significance and they certainly were that. Predictions of a 7% inflation rate and also threats of spiking interest rate hikes to bring the economy back under control with the costs of living now soaring on many levels including power and petrol, groceries and gas. We've seen the inflation rate hit 5.1% in the March quarter but the prediction was that that number would surge. Dr Lowe saying that it would reach 7% by the 
end of the year. Pushed along by COVID supply issues, the Ukraine war and now today's minimum wage increase also adding to inflation pressures as well. Of course, interest rate rises are the key tool for the RBA to try and uh, cool the economy. We've already seen them raise rates twice in the past two meetings, lifting the official rate from its pandemic low of 0.1% up to 0.85%. Those hikes quickly passed on by the retail banks. But Dr Lowe said in an overnight ABC interview he needed to, quote, do what was necessary to bring that inflation number back down. Inflation's high. It's too high. At the moment it's 5% and by the end of the year I expect inflation to get to 7%. That's a very high number and we need to be able to chart a course back to 2 to 3 percent inflation. It's unclear at the moment how far interest rates will need to go up to get that. I think it's reasonable that in interest rates get to, the cash rate gets to 2.5 percent at some point. Now Dr Lowe said he realised the impact the rate hikes would have on mortgage holders but also noted that many Australians relying on savings would welcome an interest rate increase. His prediction was that the bank's measures tied in with global factors would start to see inflation numbers come back down off a peak between January and March next year. Back to you. Thanks, Chris. Ambulance wait times in New South Wales are blown up to the point they are now at their worst in more than a decade. The combination of COVID and the flu is pushing the health system to breaking point. As Chris Ma reports. Well, it's a quarterly report on the state of the New South Wales health system and it doesn't make for good reading. The report from the Bureau of Health Information shows the impact of the Omicron strain on the system in the first few months of this year. It shows waiting times for ambulances have blown out. Over 60% of the more acute patients are not getting an ambulance within 15 minutes. There's been a big increase in calls to triple zero. More than 375,000 calls. Now that continues a trend in recent years. In emergency departments, 75% of patients requiring admission to hospital waiting beyond four hours. Elective surgery was down nearly 30% compared to pre-pandemic levels. And now there's over 100,000 people on the waiting list, a near record high. Concerningly, more than 18,000 have waited longer than clinically recommended. More than 50% of patients in Western Sydney emergency departments had to wait more than four hours to seek treatment. So we've got a critical emergency in our emergency departments. We have never experienced another quarter like it in New South Wales. It's very hard to compare that quarter to any other quarter ever reported by the BHI. Ambulance unions have called for a full independent inquiry into the hospital system, but they say plans for 2,000 extra paramedics should greatly assist the strain on them. The damage bill from a factory fire in Newcastle is expected to be around a million dollars. The complex was partially destroyed in the blaze yesterday, which forced the evacuation of more than a dozen people. Crews have spent today clearing the rubble. There was concerns of uh, storage of paint, but we, um, we got, the crews got to work quickly and, and then managed to cut the fire off. The fire isn't being treated as suspicious. Social media platform Instagram has unveiled a raft of new features to better protect its young teenage users. As Sean White explains, the tools will give parents more access and insight into what exactly their kids are up to. Whether you're liking, commenting or simply scrolling online, Instagram's Family Centre aims to provide a safer experience for kids. What they're really designed to do is get that balance right for young people. Let them have autonomy and privacy in how they use Instagram. Well, the headline feature, a supervision tool. Parents will be able to see who their children follow or are followed by. Accounts they report directly to Instagram and the exact time spent on the platform. They can just say, you know, hey, what's going on here and really open up that conversation. Sure, Sophie okay. Spooner is a mum and stepmom of four based on Sydney's northern beaches. I guess it's just trying to strike that balance between giving him freedom online, but then also being mindful that he might not have the maturity to deal with some of the issues that can come up. Instagram will also have a feature called Family Hub that's built into the app where parents can access resources from Butterfly, Origin, Project Rocket, Reach Out and eSafety. This would include articles, videos and tips on topics like how to talk to young people about social media, 
Your average teen uses around four social media services and that actually increases as they get older. So by the time they're 16 or 17, it could be five or six social media platforms. So there has to be a time during the adolescence where parents regularly talk to their child about their social media use and they make decisions together. Sean White, 7 News. A treat for stargazers last night, her supermoon shining in the night sky. The phenomenon occurs when the moon moves closer to the Earth. Last night, just before 10 o'clock, it was 365,000 kilometres away. That's about 20,000 kilometres closer than normal. Some people believe a supermoon can cause natural disasters or drive people crazy. Well, for the record, neither is true. Still to come in Sydney's afternoon news, the plea for more weapons and ammunition as Ukraine holds off Russian forces in the country's east. And the almighty mess after a truck slams straight through a Western Sydney home. You're watching Sydney's 4pm news here on 7. This is the view from Parramatta in Sydney's west where right now it's 20 degrees. In breaking news, mask wearing at airports in New South Wales will no longer be compulsory from Friday. The change follows advice from the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee. Even though masks will no longer be mandated, New South Wales Health is still recommending their use in airport terminals and other public indoor areas where physical distancing is not possible. The mask mandate will end at Canberra Airport and at airports in WA from Saturday. However, we will still have to wear a mask on board an aircraft. A Western Sydney family has narrowly escaped serious injury after a truck ploughed straight through the front of their house. Natasha Squarey is in Toongabi. Tash, it left quite the mess. Well, Anne, the truck has now been towed, but as you can see, there's significant damage to this Toongabi home and the residents are still quite shaken after the concrete mixer took out the front bedroom wall. A family of four was inside when the rig lost control around 8 this morning. Two women were in the front bedroom. They were still in bed when the house was hit. They thought there was an earthquake. I was shocked at the time because, you know, Obviously, just waking up, you're not going to know, you know, something like that's going to happen and wake you up like that. The truck had been slowly reversing down the neighbour's driveway, but when a car coming down Cornelia Road clipped the front of the mixer, it appears the truckie panicked and put his foot down. The owner of this property, who was helping to guide him, was forced to jump out of the way. I ran. I ran that way because I was behind the truck. I was on the side of the truck guiding him in. When the vehicle hit the two-storey home, it also took out two gas cylinders and caused a water main to burst. Considering what, what was actually could have happened when, when we first arrived, there was a lot of good fortune too. Both drivers were treated by paramedics here at the scene and the truckie who was shaken and confused was then taken to Westmead Hospital with minor injuries. The homeowner, who also happens to be a builder, has a mammoth cleanup ahead of him. Turning to the war in Ukraine and soldiers are pleading for more equipment and ammunition from the West as they fight off Russian forces. Ukrainian officials say more than 100 soldiers are killed every day as they lose ground in the country's east. American symbol, American weapon. Ukrainian troops try out new equipment. U.S. supplied M4 rifles fresh out of the box. Away from the front lines, these soldiers are preparing to join the battle raging in the east. This exercise is designed to accustom Ukrainian forces to the use of Western weapons. This is an American 50 caliber machine gun firing Italian bullets. There's a problem though. We're told that there's not enough Western ammunition. Ukrainian forces are slowly losing ground in the battle for the eastern Donbass region. <laughs> Morale here is high. Yet no one believes these rifles will halt the Russian advance. Ukrainian officials say Russian artillery outnumbers their artillery at a ratio of perhaps more than 10 to 1. I can protect my comrades, but unfortunately okay. I can uh, clear my country from invaders using only these rifles. So we need more 
artillery. The U.S. and its allies have delivered advanced weapon systems to Ukraine, and more are on the way. But the army here is losing men at an alarming rate, more than 100 killed in action every day, according to Ukrainian officials. We need a basic minimum to avoid more casualties. Artillery, smart weapons, radar, drones, and people to train us, says the commander, Lieutenant Oleksandr, a veteran of the French Foreign Legion. We've shown we will fight. We will learn to use these weapons. And that will take time. And time is a luxury this nation at war cannot afford. To the U.S. and despite protests, an elephant will be staying at New York's Bronx Zoo. Animal rights activists had taken court action claiming Happy the Elephant deserved some of the same rights as humans and should be set free. The court ruled while elephants are intelligent and deserve proper care and compassion, as an animal happy does not have a legal right to liberty. The judge says that if the petition had been successful, there could have been a flood of applications to free animals, possibly including pets and service animals. Next in Seven's afternoon news, an arrest made following a series of kidnappings and in sport with Mel McLaughlin, the piece of brilliance from David Warner that has Aussie, had Aussie teammates shaking their heads. Tonight on Seven News with Mark Ferguson. Wage rises for millions of Australians. How this cement truck ended up in a Toongabby home and the Instagram changes to keep your kids safe online. A man's been arrested over three separate kidnappings across Sydney. The 22-year-old was detained during a raid this morning on a home at Regent's Park. It was the culmination of investigations by Strike Force Peppers, which began after a 30-year-old man was confronted by a group of men at Punch Bowl in March last year. He was dragged onto the street and forced into a van. Links were uncovered with other kidnappings, one at Dundas Valley in 2020, another at San Susi last year. It's time for sport now with Mel McLaughlin and a big blow for the Blues, Mel. Yeah, that's right. And Rabbitohs coach Jason Demetrio has shut down any talk of Latrell Mitchell making a return for New South Wales in Origin 2 in Perth. Demetrio says the star fullback is nowhere near ready to return, having not played for 10 weeks due to hamstring and knee injuries, along with a bout of COVID. It's not about whether he's playing Origin or he's playing for us. It's about whether he's fit to play rugby league at NRL level, let alone Origin level, and he's not. Mitchell's expected to make his return against Parramatta in round 16 early next month. The Latrell saga isn't Brad Fittler's only headache ahead of the must-win clash. Daniel Tupo and Katoni Staggs are considering committing to Tonga over New South Wales. They've been named in the Tongan squad for their test against New Zealand on Saturday week, which is the day before Origin 2. Fittler names his blue squad on Sunday. Storm flyer Ryan Pappenhausen won't be considered for selection. His return from injury is on hold due to his bout of COVID. Well, he's turning 36 in a matter of months, but David Warner's still as lively as ever. Oh, that's unbelievable. What a catch that is by David Warner. Ashton Agar couldn't believe his eyes. Pat Cummins went wicketless on his return from a hip injury in the one-day series opener against Sri Lanka, chasing a rain-reduced total of 282. Glenn Maxwell kept his cool after a mini batting collapse, hammering an unbeaten 80 or 51 balls to get Australia home by two wickets. An English batting collapse looked on the cards in the final day of the second test against New Zealand at Trent Bridge. At 3 for 56, up stepped Johnny Besto. Stand and deliver, Johnny Besto. And he did, chasing 299 off 72 overs. Besto smashed England's second fastest test ton from 77 balls. His 136, along with an unbeaten 75 from skipper Ben Stokes, guided the host to a series clinching five wicket win. Cam Smith's confident he can break his major drought at this week's US Open at Brookline in Massachusetts. The Aussie world number six says he's getting much more support from tour crowds after his win at the Players' Championship in March. I think there's a little bit of a different uh, vibe on the golf course as well towards me. I think there's um, maybe a few more people rooting for me, uh, which is nice. And The US Open starts tomorrow night.
Serena Williams is returning to tennis at Wimbledon in just under a fortnight. The 23-time Grand Slam champion announced her All England club comeback on social media. 40-year-old Williams hasn't played since withdrawing from Wimbledon last year with a leg injury. Nick Kyrgios is through to the second round of the lead-up event in Germany where he'll take on world number six, Stefanos Tsitsipas. Chris Waller's nature strip has enhanced his standing as the world's best sprinter. With royalty watching at Royal Ascot, James McDonald piloted the Everest winner to victory in the Group 1 Kingstand Stakes. But unfortunately, the caller botched his name. So, nature strike leading to Acclam Express in second place. Twilight Course coming home in third position. But it is a great Australian sprinter, Nature Stripe and James McDonald. And look how far they've won by. It is the first Aussie winner at Royal Ascot since Black Caviar back in 2012. And we talked about the Socceroos early morning yesterday. Then it was a late night to watch this race last night. But a brilliant achievement. And I don't think the caller will make that mistake again. A bit awkward. <laughs> They'd be happy with a win anyhow. That's right. Thank you, Mel. This afternoon's top stories are next. The major decision to shore up Australia's energy supply. How charities are helping families doing it tough. And the impact of today's wage rise. And we'll go live to Sydney Airport as some of our Socceroos return to Australia. Live from Sydney, 7 News with Ann Sanders. Welcome back. More on our breaking news. Australia's energy market operator has suspended the electricity spot market this afternoon. This gives them complete control of directing energy supplies to power grids. His chief executive, Daniel Westerman, speaking a short time ago. Today, AMO has suspended the national electricity market. This decision was made because it was impossible to operate the system under current conditions while ensuring reliable, secure supply of electricity to Australian homes and businesses. By suspending the market, we're creating a simple process where AMO has true visibility of which generators are available and when, in advance, rather than relying on last minute interventions. That visibility will help us to uh, manage the system in real time as well as to understand the balance of supply and demand <clears throat> in the periods ahead. Despite this, conditions remain tight in the coming days, in particular in New South Wales, where we would urge consumers to conserve energy where it is safe to do so. The suspension of the market is a temporary measure and will be reviewed daily. We'll return the market to its normal state once AMO is confident that we can operate the market again and not see generators withdraw their availability. Practically, this means we're creating one single place where generators can put their availability, be dispatched in a methodical way, and have a simple, clear process for them to recover their costs. Australia's lowest paid workers are to receive an extra $40 a week in their pay packets. The Fair Work Commission has approved a rise of 5.2%. The increase is just above the rate of inflation, meaning wages will go up in real terms. It makes a difference to people who are struggling with the cost of living. The opposition, while welcoming the news, warns some businesses will be hurt by the decision and has urged the government to help. The Commission expects changes to take effect from the first pay period after the 1st of July. One person who knows how much a wage increase will help our lowest paid workers is John Robertson, the CEO of Food Bank. Good afternoon, John. Now, Food Bank's our largest food relief organisation helping charities feed vulnerable people. What's your reaction to the minimum wage going up by more than 5% today? And it's obviously a welcome and positive step forward. It will alleviate some of the difficulty that people are going through, but in reality, it's only a very small step forward. We're watching more and more people seeing cost of living pressures coming through increased rents or mortgage payments. Electricity bills are going up by at least 18 per cent. In September, we're about to see the um, reduction in fuel excise put back in place. So while it's certainly a welcome step forward, uh, there's still a long, long way to go for a lot of Australians who are still doing it really tough. It must put a lot of pressure on Food Bank with the increasing number of people looking for food relief. Well, we are seeing more and more people looking for food relief and um, I've been travelling around the state today. I'm in Griffith 
and I've met with some of our charities in Griffith today who've been telling us just how many more people are now turning up looking for food relief. Um, this is a phenomenon right across Australia and sadly um, it's going to get worse before it gets better. I think the really telling point here when we talk about uh, inflation running at 5.1%, non-discretionary spending, uh, so non-discretionary inflation uh, on items that people have no choice but to buy is actually running at around 7%. So in reality, um, this wage increase is still not going to cover off on those non-discretionary expenses um, and we are going to see people doing it tough. So for those who can, what can we do to help Food Bank in times of such high demand? Well, the obvious thing is if people can afford is a donation. Um, we've been forced to purchase more and more food to keep up with demand. Uh, people can just go to foodbank.org.au uh, and make a donation. $35 obviously helps. Uh, but whatever people can afford would obviously go a long way to allowing us to purchase more food so we can get it to our charity partners and they can get it out to people who've got real need. John Robertson from Food Bank New South Wales, thanks a lot for your time this afternoon and all the best through winter. Thank you. The local share market lost further ground today. The ASX 200 closing at 6,601 points, down more than 7% in the past five days. That's a new low for at least the past year. And as our network finance editor Gemma Acton reports, it's now hurting our super returns. Good afternoon. After all of yesterday's share market drama, today was a quieter day. Uh, but usually after you see a very steep sell-off, the next day you're looking to see a recovery of sorts. The ASX 200 could not deliver that today. It was another down day, with the index closing down around 1.3%. Some of the hardest hit stocks yesterday were under pressure again today, including Afterpay owner Block and online jobs platform Seek. However, mining giant Fortescue, which lost 6% yesterday, has now clawed back some of those losses. Although all else equal, rising interest rates help banks to grow their profits. It has been a tough week for financial services companies. They've fallen around 12% since last week's RBA rate rise. That's on fears stretched consumers will struggle to pay off their debts and the property market is expected to take a hit. If you're positioned uh, with the miners and the oil and gas companies, you're doing very well and I think they'll continue to do well into this recovery. Super experts say after the recent bumpy ride for markets, any positive returns for the average super fund gained earlier in the year could be washed out by June 30th. We've seen a, a lot of ups and downs uh, during the financial year and it looks like we're ending in neg negative territory if the current trend continues. That follows a return of close to 18% last year and an annual average return of around 7% since the super system was first launched. Some of our Socceroos are on their way home after qualifying for the World Cup, beating Peru in a nail-biter of a game earlier yesterday morning. Matt Shervington is at Sydney Airport for us this afternoon. Hi there, Shervo. Do you think that they're partying on the plane? Uh, that's right, Anne. Yeah, definitely some sore heads. We're going to see a number of Socceroos players come to a hero's welcome here at Sydney Airport. With family, friends and fans, well, they're all going to turn out eagerly awaiting that arrival. It comes off that 5-4 penalty shootout win over Peru, which secured their place in the World Cup. It'll be their fifth consecutive World Cup appearance since 2006. Five players are due to arrive, including captain Matt Ryan, Awa Mabil, who scored a goal in that penalty shootout, and the man of the moment, replacement goalie and Andrew Redmayne. He's become an overnight success. He saved two goals to secure the win for Australia and send them through to the World Cup and he's etched his name into sporting folklore not dissimilar to that of John Aloisi in 2005. We are hoping that possibly Andrew Redmayne's wife will come along with his one-year-old daughter in Poppy because apparently the celebratory face that he put on is the same face he uses to get a smile out of that daughter Poppy when he's at home. So who knows, we might get to see that this afternoon. Quick turnaround for the Socceroos. Many players going back into club duties and then they build up to the World Cup at the end of the year. They'll face Denmark and Tunisia in their pool groups. And then, and well, it's a tough one to start off the campaign. They face the reigning World Cup champions in France on November 23. All right, good luck to them. Matt Shervington at Sydney Airport. Thank you very much, Matt. Amber Heard is refusing to back down after losing her defamation trial against ex-husband Johnny Depp in her first sit-down interview since the trial. The actress blamed a social media onslaught for swaying the verdict. A US Bureau Chief Ashley Mullaney reports. After a jury ruled that Amber Heard defamed her ex-husband, Johnny Depp, by claiming he abused her, she has now levelled those allegations at him again. 
to my dying day, will stand by every word of my testimony. We get the concept of free speech from the Greeks. My understanding of what that means is not just the freedom to speak. It's a freedom to speak truth to power. Yeah. And that's all I spoke. And I spoke it to power and I paid the price. In a talk show interview this morning, Amber Heard said she was unfairly okay. treated, that the social media the uh, onslaught must have impacted the verdict. I think even the most well-intentioned juror, it would have been impossible to avoid this. In this interview, she said that when you're living with violence, you have to learn to adapt. It was an at times a tense interview. Savannah Guthrie, the breakfast show host, uh, pointing out audio where Amber Heard could be heard uh, saying that she started some of these fights. What you would hear in those clips are not evidence of what was happening. It was evidence of a negotiation of how to talk about that with your abuser. The actress admitted that the pair of them could have come across as Hollywood brats. She conceded that their relationship was toxic and ugly and that she wasn't entirely proud of her own uh, behaviour in that relationship too. Still, she's been ordered to pay more than $10 million to Johnny Depp, money that her lawyers say she simply cannot afford to pay and she plans to appeal the decision. A 12-year-old boy has been hit by a car at Box Hill. Paramedics and the Careflight medical team treated the child at the scene before he was taken to Westmead Hospital. He's said to be in a stable condition. The driver of the car is talking to police. Three of Australia's major retailers are under fire after it was revealed they're using facial recognition technology in their stores. As Evan Batten explains, the majority of customers weren't aware it was happening. Good afternoon, Anne. Yeah, well, anyone who's walked into a major retailer and wondered how they're using their security camera vision that they're recording of you will be alarmed to learn that a number of major retailers are now admitting to using facial recognition software. Bunnings and Kmart are among them who say at this stage it's only for a trial. Choice asked 25 major retailers if they were using facial recognition technology after a tip-off by one of its members. They admitted to scanning the facial features of every customer who walks into the store and cross-checking it against a list of known individuals who may have been suspected of shoplifting or causing trouble in other ways. That does raise a lot of questions about the accuracy of this technology. We don't know how accurate it is. And Choice is ultimately asking for an investigation to be carried out by the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner to see if any breaches have occurred. Bunnings, in response, has said it's disappointed by Choice's research here, calling it an inaccurate characterisation of Bunnings' use of facial recognition technology. It's only used in selected stores, it says, and only to keep team members and customers safe. Kmart says much the same sort of thing. It stores the data only for 30 days or so. The Australia Institute, Anne, says it should all stop now until legal protections can be put in place. Anne? We're live to ComSec for the very latest on your money. Also, which royals are set to relocate? And the best pie in Australia revealed. It might not be quite what you expect. It's 19 degrees in Manly and you will have our forecast soon. A mushroom pie made in Victoria by Rolling Pin Bakery has taken out top honour, named Australia's best pie. It's made with three types of mushrooms, cheddar, parmesan, herbs and a truffle filling, all wrapped in a golden pastry. It's the first time a vegetarian pie has won the prize. Let's check finance now with Stephen Daglian at Comsec. Hi there, Steve. The losing streak continues for the Australian share market. Good afternoon, and it certainly does. And in fact, already last week, we were doing quite poorly, poorly because of the biggest rate hike in 22 years here in Australia. But now all the market's attention is being soaked up by the United States, where we could very well tomorrow morning get the biggest interest rate lift in America in almost 28 years. This continues to spook markets. It's one of the reasons why we're on a four-day losing streak now, and our market fell by another 1.3% today as well. So losses across the board, all 11 sectors were down led by some of those most interest rate sensitive sectors, including technology and property stocks. Also, energy stocks generally headed backwards on concerns that rising rates could reduce demand for fuel in some parts. So Harvey Norman, JB Hi-Fi, also in that retail space doing quite poorly. The Aussie dollar finally sitting at about 69.1 USA. All right, Stephen, thank you. Stephen Daglian from Comsec.
Sydney's 6pm News is coming up with Mike Ferguson. Hi there, Fergo. What's the latest from the newsroom? Yeah, good afternoon, and Plenty keeping us busy this afternoon. We'll have more on that increase to the minimum wage, which will give more than 2.5 million Australians an extra $40 a week, the biggest rise in 16 years. Tonight, why the Reserve Bank Governor says it won't keep workers ahead for very long. Also, the major supermarket freezing the price of hundreds of essential items to help with the rising living costs. A narrow escape for a Western Sydney family after a concrete mixer crashed through their home. Why the number of speeding fines across Sydney has doubled in a month. The big retailers keeping a secret record of your face, why it's been slammed as inappropriate and unnecessary. The new Instagram controls to keep your children safe online. And an incredible look at Western Sydney's new airport taking shape at Badgeries Creek. And all that and plenty more, 7 News tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll see you then, Fergo. Thank you. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are reportedly set to leave their London apartment and move into a home in Windsor with their children. As Europe Bureau Chief Hugh Whitfeld reports, they could relocate within weeks. William and Kate have spent the day with the families of the victims of the Grenfell Tower fire tragedy five years after the deadly blaze tore through an apartment block here in London. As reports emerge, they're preparing to leave their Kensington Palace base not far from uh, Grenfell Tower for Adelaide Cottage, a four-bedroom house in the Windsor Great Park, very close to the Queen at Windsor Castle, close to Eton College where George and Louis might be heading one day, of course, where William and Harry went to high school, and close to the Middletons, Kate's parents who live not far away in Berkshire. It would require a change in schools for the three Cambridge children. And this cottage doesn't need staff and it doesn't need renovations either, so it's considered the perfect fit for the young family. Meantime, a short carriage ride away from Windsor, Charles and Camilla have led the Royal Pack at Royal Ascot, where racing has returned. They might have even watched an Aussie winner today. There was no sign of Her Majesty, though. Many of the Queen's horses running at Ascot later in the week. Thanks, Hugh. Time now for a check on Sydney's traffic. Good afternoon, Marina Ivanovic here in the train link traffic chopper. Extensive delays in the Harbour Tunnel. We've got a breakdown mid in the tunnel heading northbound in the left lane with delays back into East Lakes. And this is the run now. If you're heading through North Mead for James Bruce Drive outbound towards Church Street, delays back into Pennant Hills Road. Visiting friends and family, let New South Wales train link do the driving. Get great value regional train and coach travel when you book online. Search New South Wales train link. A backyard fight between an emu and its owner has gone viral on social media platform TikTok. The family's used an unusual weapon of choice to keep their pet at bay. Bet you've never seen a pool noodle used like this. A Texas man has weaponized the noodle to fend off a pet emu named Cosmo. I turned my back and wham, he bites me right on top of the head and it hurts pretty good. Toby and Michelle Wilson have had these two emus since they hatched five years ago. But once the birds had their own baby a few months ago... <sighs> yikes! Cosmo has gotten protective and aggressive. I took a pull noodle, cut it in half, and just um, hot glued it uh, to a cowboy hat. The hat didn't help, but the videos have sure been a hit on TikTok. Toby says lots of commenters complain about his poor mowing technique, but you try mowing with a giant bird charging you. I tell him, I say, look, bird, you better get away. Don't do it, don't do it. I'm going to give you the noodle. The noodle is all that stands between mowing and being mowed down. Next in Seven's Afternoon News, well, Angie Asimus will be here with your very latest weather forecast. This weather report brought to you by Bridgestone Select for tyres and car servicing. Let's check the forecast now, Angie. It's been a beautiful afternoon. It has, and We had a late afternoon surge in heat, ending up with our warmest day so far this season by a long way. We reached a top of 21 degrees after 3pm, a long way to climb considering the starting point of just 6 degrees first thing. The latest satellite image shows high pressure over the Tasman Sea, extending that settled weather over most of the state, while a trough is approaching from the southwest, that'll just skim southern New South Wales, bringing some showers, but the main impact will be through the southernmost states. Given that, 
Adelaide expecting a shower or two tomorrow. Melbourne to also see showers, a top of just 15. Canberra, a couple of light showers remaining fine though for Hobart, Brisbane, Perth and Darwin. It'll be quite a pleasant 24 hours ahead for Sydney. We're looking at a low of 9 degrees tonight, spot on the June average and then a top of 20 will follow. It'll be sunny with light winds early with westerlies picking up from about the middle of the day. Ahead, most of Friday will be partly cloudy but a late shower will develop mainly on the coast. That sets us up for a shower or two over the weekend. Lighter totals carrying on through the working week but that cloud cover will allow for some warmer mornings. A low of 12 degrees in the CBD on Monday, 11 on Tuesday. Top staying around that 19 or 20 degree mark. More weather at 6, Anne. All right, Angie, thank you. And that is Sydney's 4pm news for this Wednesday. Mark Ferguson will bring you 7 News at 6. I'm Anne Sanders. Stay with 7 now for The Chase Australia. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Have a lovely night.